I was um, cut up by this thing that I heard the other day, uh, a few, actually a couple of weeks ago. I was talking to uh, Brother Eddie in Denver, Colorado. Most of you know him. He's a missionary that we started working with here many years ago. And then he moved to uh, Denver and he worked for uh, many years there with the Latino community. For a long time, he's been wanting to find somebody who could take care of the work. And every time I talk to him, he says, I'm getting older, he's in his 80s now, he says, and it's becoming harder and harder to find somebody. Actually, they're finding it harder to find people in the church who will be committed uh, to serving. He said, something happened here in Denver, actually in many places in the United States, after COVID, we got over COVID, but we didn't get over the spiritual lacking that people experienced during COVID. And when he went to visit some of those people that did not come back, they said, oh, don't worry about it, Pastor, we're okay. Um, we learned during COVID that we could go to church without leaving the house. Now, all we have to do is turn on the computer and we can get fed from uh, different places. Actually, we can choose the people that preach we want. And then just a couple of days ago, I talked to him again. He gave me some good news and bad news. And uh, the bad, and I'm not going to, I'll share the good news some other time. But he said, Sammy, there is a crisis in the United States. And we're seeing it very, very clearly here in Denver, Colorado. Churches are being closed, right? And right. A lot of the churches that are still open will probably change their format in order to please or to, um, um, to feed the appetite of the people, to, to please them in what they want. It doesn't seem, he said, it doesn't seem like people come uh, for what God wants, it's more what pleases us. I got to thinking about that, and then I thought about this other preacher, you know him, brother, uh, Dr. Ro uh, Roger um, McCarty from Los Gatos Baptist Church in um, Los Gatos, California in the Silicon Valley, very rich area. Uh, he said to me some time ago, he said, Sammy, uh, the, the, the people in the church are growing old. And uh, of course, coming to this area to just rent a house, it starts from $4,000 up, just to rent. Don't think about what, buying a house over $2 million for any simple home. And the people that come over here are, you know, will probably have very high salaries, and we've had some that were Christians and came to the church very relaxed and they said what do you have to offer that attitude when we told them about the life of the church the ministries of the church they said what we see now is people come to church like uh, if we can offer them a menu a um, something for them to be checked in or out and say well this is what I want if you have it then I'll come if not well I'll just keep on looking all this has been going through my mind and I'm thinking where are we heading? You know, we're right on, on schedule. When we look at the Bible and the, we see the predictions, and the, or the, the prophecies that uh, the Apostle gives us about the future days, we will see that spirituality will grow colder and colder and colder. Very few will be able to stand. So, thinking about this, I thought, Lord, wouldn't it be nice if we would have Church members like, um, um, you know, like the, in the first century, uh, um, Barnabas, for example, would be the, the perfect church member. The I, I'll probably preach on, on, I might just preach on that next week. The ideal church member. Barnabas is one of those who would be always willing to engage in any situation and do whatever in order to please his, his Lord. <clears throat> this afternoon, I'd like to read a couple of articles that I, I came across and then I'll get into the message. It has to do with how to be a good church member. I'm sure all of us here this afternoon would want to be a good church member. This article that I came across for us, it said, if every church member was like you, this, this is going to sting. Or it might just please you, I don't know. I actually, when I came across this, it reminded me of, of, of over 10 years ago when I was in Sydney Baptist Church in 
Pacific in California and asked this question in my message. And then I found almost the same words in this article. And this question kind of left the church over there stunned. I wonder how, what reaction it will have with you and me this afternoon. It says, if every church member was like you, would your church be healthy? Would there even be a church? So when it comes to church life, every church member matters. Everyone. So in this article, there was, I want to read some things here, then I'll go to my points. It says, how many people do you know who don't take church membership seriously? Church membership matters, and in order to have a healthy church, there are the specific characteristics that every church member must strive to possess. Well, this is not an exhaustive list regarding church membership. It's one that we should consider as we examine ourselves, our motives, and our service within the local church. And then it gives a list. So again, when I read these things, things come to my mind. I remember um, uh, Bill Carter, I don't know if you remember him, he preached one message one time. I, I hardly remember what he preached on, but I remember his outline. He said, every Christian must be fat. He was kind of chubby himself. So I said, yes, he's, he's keeping, keeping with it then. And I said, fat as F-A-T, faithful as a painful, a preventable, and tifa trustworthy. And then he went on and preached his message. I'm not going to preach on that this afternoon. But according to this article, he gave um, several, eight characteristics. One, as uh, faithful church members, we, just like those in the first century, must be teachable. We, uh, and the word for, um, uh, you know, for disciple in the scripture, you see the word learner, the translation is the learner. So when we come to the church, we should have a willingness to learn, to really learn. Disciples are constantly learning and growing in grace, and it gives Hebrews 5, 12. And then in this list, it says, be usable, when Paul used the illustration of the human testimony, uh, anatomy to describe the importance of the local church membership, he was driving home a very important point. It points here to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, verses 12 to 26, where it, 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 you know, it can bring you a contrast. If, if a, if uh, the ear should say, because I am, I'm sorry, if the ear should say, because I am not an eye, I do not belong to the body, that would not make it any less a part of the body. If the whole body were an eye, would, uh, where, where would be the sense of hearing and so on? Uh, so, you know, when it comes to being usable, how we, when we come to church, as it says here, just to sit or to serve. That's very important, usable, and being lovable. You know, the Lord said to his disciples, in this they will know that you are my disciples, that you love one another. And this love needs to be shown. So as a faithful church member, we need to show love one for another. There's plenty of verses, and most of them are uh, given by John, the apostle, 1 John 4, verse eight, 7 through 8, love, love one another, for God is love, and was a, who, who, and whoever loves has been born of God and knows God. Anyone who does not love uh, does not know God because God is love. Be this visible uh, or available. Some members of the church only show up 20-25% of the time of the time. This is what Brother Eddie is experiencing, especially after COVID. You can count on me for a church service, but you know the rest of the week, um, you know I've got things to do. This is some of the excuses that we find today. On uh, the side, it says some people are constantly in the shadows. They operate in the uh, peripheral. I don't, I don't know how to pronounce that. Yeah. Peripheral. They arrive late, sit in the back, leave early, and are typically present 20, 20, 20 to 50 percent of the time. However, this is not God's plan for his church. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 24 to 25, it says, let us consider how to, this is another version from the James, uh, King James, I'm reading it directly from the article, and let us consider how to stir one uh, another to love and good works. 
not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another and all the more as you see that they draw near, the coming of the Lord is near. How many of us believe that the Lord is close to, is, is coming soon? Mm -hmm. So these things should be seen more than ever in our, in, our, in our church life. How do we stir up others in the church? How do we love others who maybe are not present? How do we serve one another when you're not present? How do we encourage one another when you're not present? The article becomes very, very um, difficult to read because you see that a lot of these things are not seen today in many churches. But look, look at this one. It says, be critical. Now, I thought we should be critical. But what he, well, I think what he means by this is that we should be sensitive to one another's if they're practicing, if they're living in sin. So it says this, rather than just allowing people to engage in open and rebellious sinful behavior, we are to get involved in and warn others about their sinful behavior in order to prevent sinful living. This means that we are to be pursuing holiness, and when someone in the church deviates from the path of righteousness, we are to hold one another accountable. Amen? Be forgivable. We are quick to expect God to forgive us while at the same time withholding to forgive others. There's so much information on this one, I'm not going to read it all. Be sacrificial. The Great Commission involves going, praying, sending, and discipling in all these uh, areas locally and internationally. In order for the wheels of ministry to turn, all the church must be faithful in sacrificing to accomplish the goals and be missional. What is the mission of the church? You know that we are here with the exclusive mission to go and preach the gospel, baptize, and uh, teach all to obey God's, uh, God's word. Be missional. We must all remember that we're not the center of the uh, of God's. Uh, we're not the center of God's story. Jesus is the center of God's story. And we need to involve, and we need to be involved in the drama of God's redemptive, redemptive plan through the through our relationship with Jesus Christ. It just goes on and on. And uh, you know, when you read an article like that, you think you can't just sit back and say, "Okay, let me move on to something else." So, so I was looking for a topic to preach on. I thought, "Well, why don't we preach on this?" So let's pray and let's investigate this idea a bit more. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you because you've given us a record. You've given us um, uh, information on how we are to live both in the first century and now in the 21st century. Father, don't allow this church or any other church to become lukewarm, to become just a, a social place to go to, a club, a spiritual club or a religious club to go to. May we, may you find us, Lord, uh, um, with, a, with a fervent spirit, ready to um, sacrifice whatever. May you find us as a, living as a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is really what's reasonable uh, to all of us, should be reasonable to all of us. I pray, Lord, that this message that I bring today will drive deep in our heart, and if we find anything here, Lord, that is not uh, set to your standards that we might uh, confess it and correct it. I pray, Lord, that this will be something that if, uh, Lord, uh, if we change these things uh, in our life, that maybe we can actually stimulate others to love and good works. Maybe we can start something in the church. I pray, Lord, you help me with my English and help, with the, help me flow uh, with the ideas and and Lord may your spirit take over in every with, in every situation here this afternoon. In Jesus' name, amen. Yeah. I'd like you to turn your Bibles to First Thessalonians. First Thessalonians chapter one. Years ago I I uh, I preached on this book many, many years ago. 
And it really impacted me because of the stand, the high standards of, that Paul presents you here with the Church of Thessalonica. As we open this book in verse 5, it says, For our gospel came not unto you in word only, but also in power, and in the Holy Ghost, and in much assurance, as you know what manner of men we are among you for your sake. And ye became followers of us and of the Lord, notice here, followers of us, the following, the example of the Apostle Paul and his, and his company, and of the Lord, having received the word in much affliction and joy uh, of the Holy Ghost, so that you were as, uh, examples, or I would say examples, I'm not sure how to, to all that believe in Macedonia and Achaia. So here you would have two different regions that were looking uh, to the uh, people there, and uh, uh, Christians in Thessalonica, were saying, well, that's the way to go, that's the way to do things. In verse 8 it says, For whom you, uh, for from you sounded out the word of the Lord, not only in Macedonia and Achaia, but also in every place your faith to God word is preached, it's spread abroad, so that we need not to speak anything. Now one, you need to understand first of all what the, what the church is. If you talk about the universal body of, of Christ, it will be all the Christians will be redeemed. We find that very clearly. Um, talk in First Corinthians chapter 12 verse 13. We refer that to all those who have been um, born again uh, um, in the Spirit of God uh, they will be part of the, they will be called the universal church but then we, the, the way this universal church uh, uh, in the practical way we, we need to look at the, the concept of the local church and a good definition for the local church is this. Now remember that we need to have a definition. This is what we are here for. A visible assembly of called out believers who have been baptized and who have covenanted together to follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ. If we're not going to follow the teachings of the Lord Jesus Christ, what are we? So when it comes to standards, we need to go back to the Bible and say, Lord, how were things done in the first century? How should we do this in the 21st century? Should we make things more modern? Should we just cut corners and you know, just give them their minimum? How should we do things today? So as I read this here and I compare it to what's happening in different parts of the world, uh, the church is in trouble. We are in trouble. I don't know what you saw when you were there in, in England, John. You said things don't seem to be getting any better. Uh -huh. It'd be interesting to see how many churches, those classic buildings that now have been turned into restaurants or malls. I saw that when I was there one time. It was heartbreaking. Why? Why is this happening? Could it ever happen to our church here in Aruya? Could it ever happen to the church over there in Luxembourg? Any other church? It will if we don't take seriously the Word of God. If we don't take seriously this that we call church membership, but, but uh, biblical stuff. So I have several things I'd like to note this afternoon, kind of adding to this article. First of all, church members should be saved and sure. The biggest problem with Christianity today is the fact that many churches are filled with unregenerate people. You know, this is not for anybody in particular, and often in general, but one of the first things we do, and I think... Uh, um, um, we saw that this week twice, at least for me, was, you know, talk to people about, you know, getting baptized. What does this mean? And for me, it's now become very important to go through the plan of salvation when you get saved and so on. Because, you know, if you really weren't saved, there's no business in getting baptized, right? I mean, the baptism is a testimony of something that's already happened, which is salvation. What kind of testimony are we going to get if we didn't experience that salvation? So it's very important for a church to go through these things and say, okay, is a person that's getting baptized sure, is he sure that he's saved? Um, it, many people just simply don't know how this works. On Thursday, I, I went to a home of a family that's been coming to church for quite some time now. They were very excited because they were also, uh, you know, counted as candidates to, well, for, to get set, uh, baptized next Sunday. And, and they were smiling at me when I was ready to give the lesson on baptism. And I said, first of all, I'd like to hear your testimony. And they were all over the map. 
I think I said, you know, you've had a long journey to get to this point, but I think there's something missing here if I count on what you just said. And uh, there, there, there was no clear biblical uh, uh, principles uh, in their testimony when it came to salvation. So I put my notes away, and I opened the Bible and said, let's look into the Bible to see what biblical salvation is all about. And these two, the lady, mom, and daughter were there, just listening. Their eyes were becoming bigger and bigger and bigger as we went through the scriptures. And when I went through them and sh showed them that we are, before salvation, we are in deep trouble, that our sin puts us in deep trouble against the Holy God, they became very concerned. And then they said, how do you fix that? So I let them speak again. They said, well, you know, you try to be a good person. And you try to do this, you try to do that. They never said, Jesus Christ, we need to come to Jesus Christ and receive the gift of salvation. Because if we don't have that, we're not making it into heaven. It, it was, it, they were all over the map. So I had to go again and said, I've just given you the bad news. According to the bad news, where would you go today? And they said, they looked at each other and said, we will go to hell. I said, that's good news. They do understand that. that. That's a big improvement from what you know happened, what you said half an hour ago. I said, would you like to hear the good news now? And I went through the good news and the, they, they smiled even bigger. Their smile just became even bigger. And when I showed them, uh, I had to be very clear, very specific, because I didn't want to just be general, just skip over the important point. What I'm trying to say here is that, you know, this has to be a very clear situation in the person. So any person, uh, many people just don't know what it means to be born again. They, they, they're like Nicodemus in John 3. Uh, how, can a, how can you be born again? Can you enter your mother's womb for a second time? They think just going to church makes them right with God. Some do. When Jesus said, you must be born again, he let no one out. There is no exception. That means me, everybody, every individual. So my friend, if you're here this afternoon, and you don't know if you're born again, if you're saved, please, please talk to me. You know, we keep on worshiping when we call each other brother, but sometimes that is not true. Listen to what 2 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 5 says. John mentioned it before. Examine yourselves, whether you be in the faith. Prove your own selves. Know ye not your own selves, how that Jesus Christ is in you, except you be reprobates? So, you know, this is, this is very important. Before we call somebody brother, we, may, we maybe should be asking, have you been born again? Not only should we know that we are saved, but we should be sure that we are saved. I was very thankful for Brother um, uh, Ronald that after um, we, we went through these points, and very passionate, he says, Hey kids, this is a sure thing. You never lose it. You never lose it. I remember that moment because I got emotional too. You never lose it. You have some churches today where they teach that you can lose your salvation. Maybe that's the reason why some churches have got closing. I don't know. Not only are we to be to uh, be church member, not only are the church members are to be saved, but they need to be sure. First John five thirteen says, "These things have I written unto you that believe on the name of the name, uh, believe on the name." Uh, I think I wrote, wrote this wrong that ye may know that you have an eternal life, and that ye may believe on the name of the Son of God. Be sure, know that you're saved. And secondly, church members should be baptized biblically. You come across some, uh, some who maybe come from different denominations. They say, oh, I know I'm saved, but I was baptized by sprinkling. Listen, that's not baptism. Baptism has shown, it gives us a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Tell me what sprinkling does. What kind of picture that does. Try to bury a horse by sprinkling some dirt on top. If you think you can succeed, go back two weeks later and see how it smells. No, my friends, when you sprinkle, you should call it rantiso. Am I pronouncing that right, Brother Tim? 
close. Rantizo. Then again, you have people who say, no, that's okay, it doesn't matter, just a, uh, just a, a bowl of water will do. I know that we're short of water, but come on, you know. Uh, biblically, Matthew 28, verse 19 says, Go ye therefore and teach all nations, submerging them, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. This is something we cannot be cutting corners on. Baptism is a picture of the death, burial, and resurrection. It identifies you as you as what you are now in Jesus Christ. Baptism is a picture of the new birth. It shows to others that you are no longer the person you used to be. You know, when we open this um, lid that we have here next week, uh, check it and see what this reminds you of. Some time ago we had a, a lady and we were getting things prepared and she walked in and she saw us and said, who are you burying? <laughs> that looks like a tomb. I said, exactly, that's what it is. You know, Tim, I don't want to take your message away, Brother Tim, but he's going to be giving us different examples of what baptism is. And one of them is a funeral without mourning, he said. No sadness here, but there is a funeral. You boys, next week we're gonna we're gonna celebrate your funeral, amen. But we're not gonna stay there. We're gonna celebrate your resurrection with Jesus Christ. That's where the joy is coming. We're actually doing something. We're telling people that uh, Jared and uh, Liam, they're dead. They're no longer the one that used to be to a week ago. And by the way, let's remember that ourselves that when we decide to come before the church and give a testimony about, about salvation and get baptized, let's make sure that that's not just the first step of obedience, that's the first of many more steps of obedience. I've come across some of the folks in the church in the past who, you know, gave a testimony of faith. They said, I want to do this because it's the first step of obedience and then they didn't do anything else after that in years. Never really were committed. I said, what did you not understand? We have people today that they are in and out, up and down, no, con and no continuancy, and no consistency in their life. Number four, church members should pray one for another. James five sixteen says, "Pray one for another." Uh, and remember, when we studied the book of Colossians, Paul taught us to pray one for another, to pray for him, which means that we should get together to pray one for another. This is why we have midweek services. We should be ready to engage in that and get to know each other, get to know the problems, the, the trials that we're having. That, and so that we can say, okay, hey, how's this going along? And, well, I still have problems, but you know, it, it kind of helps that you're remembered and you're, you're, you're praying. Men ought to always pray, Luke chapter 18, verse 1. First Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. The, the, the early church prayed, they made uh, church meetings, uh, pray, uh, prayer meetings. Shouldn't we do the same? Shouldn't we, we be available for those? And then, seven, because I need to go fast here, church members should be givers. Not only should be, we be givers, but we should be cheerful givers. When the moment uh, John says, okay, let's uh, prepare for the offering, we should all, all be smiling. Wow, we've been looking forward for that all week. I'm not saying you're going to have to jump up and down, but this should be something that brings joy to your heart, especially if you understand where this is going. It's not only to keep this church going, but it's to keep those missionaries going. Amen? Amen. Brother uh, 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 Thomas and Elena, all the way from Germany, they're, they're, they're still here, but believe it or not, because they've been preparing these slides a weekly slide, they call each one of these missionaries one a week and they call them and say, hey, what is your need? What can we help you with? How can we uh, alleviate your burden? How can, you, how, how can we as a church be a blessing to you? I talked to Brother Eddie and he says, man, they were really uh, asking me all kinds of questions. I said, yeah, we are concerned. 
If I have attended the church calling me all the way from another part of, you know, from that part of, you know, asking me, we are concerned. We don't want all, all these things, uh, financial support. We are really interested to know how the church is working. How can we be of some support in the spiritual area? How can we pray for you? We should be givers. We should be praying one for another. The church cannot survive without givers. God has a plan to support his work. And it is called, and it does it through tithing. God, uh, good churches, church members should be givers. And then church members should always witness for Christ. Be always ready. When you get up in the morning, be ready. Be, be praying, first of all. Lord, um, I'm, I'm not here in this country. When we get to First Peter chapter 1, verse 1, you see this more in detail. How many did you know, those of you who come from different countries, which means all of us, how many of you know that you are a seed that God is sprinkling in different, over here in Arizona on the earth? Did you know that? He said, oh, no, no, I came for the sun. Well, I came for it because I had a good job over here. Oh, there was plenty of reasons why I came here, but never thought that God put me here, even though through those circumstances, He put me here to be a testimony to the people around us. That brings missions to a complete different level. It's not about just sending these missionaries. We should have mission minds. Amen? Come on, get excited. Amen. I'm getting excited about this. Be willing to tell the gospel to every creature. Good church members are witnesses for Christ. And then I have a few more minutes before I receive people walking in. Church members should be committed. Committed to what? To or first of all, to the Lord Jesus Christ. Also to the well-being of the church, and then committed to the furtherance of the gospel. Now, this is, this is not an exhaustive list. We could go on and on. But the, what I'm trying to say this afternoon, when we look there in First Thessalonians 1, 5 through 8, we see that the church in Thessalonica understood. Paul kind of had this church as a trophy, like the brightest stone in his crown as he calls it you are my crown of glory why because they understood that when they heard the gospel uh, it wasn't just to get saved but to serve when you heard the word it says it wasn't just for, for your salvation but to serve the living God you see that very in very clearly in 1 Thessalonians chapter 1. And I'll finish with 1 Corinthians 15, 58. Therefore, my beloved brethren, be ye steadfast, unmovable. This is the message for Roy Elamia today. And I challenge you to examine your life, examine your service, examine your relationship with the Lord. And if it doesn't fall in this template, if it doesn't match what we've been seeing, and you come to the Lord and say, Lord, I need you to work in my life. These needs need to be in the right place. You know why? Because you might be next. You might be one of those Christians who just simply desires to check into the web and find something that will give you the spark. And then feel like you've done your, your job. Friends, we live in the 21st century and we need to revive. We need revival. We really need revival. Let's have a stand. Let's stand and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, each of us will have to answer the question this evening. What kind of member are we this afternoon? Are we the ones who pitch in and help and further the, the work, or are we the ones who become a stumbling block because we don't really get uh, involved? Maybe we've made our Christian lives just a thing of reading the Bible and go to church on Sunday, but that's not even close to what we should be doing. And I pray, Lord, that you will continue working in this church, that we take these words seriously. If we don't do it now, Lord, one day we're going to have to face you in the judgment seat of Christ, and we will have to give account then. We'll be 
tears because we didn't match up to what you were asking us to do? Or will there be joy because we hear those words, good and faithful servant? Lord, work in our life today. Help us, Lord. Check these things out. And make the changes necessary, Lord, to match your demands. In Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen.